So in this tutorial uh, we're going to create a simple static simulation in SOLIDWORKS and uh, in this particular case we're going to look at uh, an I-beam so the sort of I-beam that you might find uh, in a building supporting a span. So the first thing that we're going to do is quickly sketch out and create a feature uh, an extrude feature to create the I-beam so we're going to create a new part uh, we're going to sketch the I-beam shape on one of the planes. Uh, before I begin sketching, uh, because most I-beams are symmetrical about the horizontal and vertical axes, I'm going to put in two uh, center lines to use as lines of symmetry. So there's my first center line, hit escape, uh, put my second center line in, uh, and again I've allowed these center lines to lock to the uh, vertical plane here and the horizontal plane so they're locked in position and then I'm going to quickly sketch out some solid lines to define a quarter shape of my I-beam so by an I-beam I mean that sort of shape and then I hit escape when I don't need the line tool anymore and then we're going to mirror the shape so I selected the mirror tool it's already selected the last line that I uh, was working on there I'm going to select the other solid lines in this sketch and then I'm going to go to the mirror about box and uh, pick the vertical in this case and then if I hit the right mouse button you can see that it's mirrored it about the uh, vertical center line so I'm going to just repeat that again mirror tool pick all the uh, solid lines in my sketch and then do it about the horizontal line as well so mirror about this horizontal line and again I can just hit the right mouse button and it okays that so I'll put the first dimension in smart dimension tool here we'll give the thing a height uh, I think we'll give it 150 mil uh, we need to put a thickness on there for the center section or the web there uh, something around 10 uh, we'll give it a thickness for the top and the bottom section as well, maybe 15 and then we'll give it a width as well, maybe 100 so you can see that we fully defined that sketch, it's, uh, all the sketch lines are black which means uh, we're in control of that, we've locked it down using either relations uh, most of them that were automatically added as I was sketching or we've put dimensions on the uh, key sizes there, so we're in control of that the system can't change that. So we'll locate okay that sketch. We'll create an extrude. I'm just going to find the sketch in the feature tree here. So there it is, sketch one. Uh, I get the preview for the extrude. You can see that the extrude's currently going in a single direction because it's set as the blind value here. Uh, I'm going to change that to the mid plane so I get uh, whatever value I put, half of it will go in one direction, half will go in the other that's quite convenient for us because uh, later on we need to uh, find the center of this beam so obviously the front plane now intersects the center of the beam so we'll make this a bit longer I'm going to make it two and a half meters long and uh, you can actually just type that so if you put 2.5 and just write an M after it the system knows that you're uh, talking about meters and it will convert that into the uh, default units for this part which are millimeters currently so that's quite useful uh, we'll ok that so essentially that's the structure of our I-beam uh, created now but when we go through into the simulation portion uh, of this tutorial what we're going to try and simulate is a large weight, weight uh, sitting in the center of this beam whilst the beam is being supported uh, at either end by uh, sitting let's say on some block work uh, of the building so it won't be supported along its entire length on the underside it'll just be supported on uh, small rectangular areas at either end of the beam and the loading in this particular case uh, we're going to constrain to a small rectangular area in the center of the uh, top of the beam here so in order to do that we need to split these faces up uh, into uh, multiple faces so you can see when I click on the top face there it just selects it as one continuous face 
uh, and as we've said we want to load a little rectangular portion in the center so what we're going to have to do is split this top face into three pieces a small rectangular piece in the center and then two larger pieces at either end so we're going to do that now by selecting the face and then sketching on the face so that's uh, this new sketch icon here and again if your system doesn't rotate around to view the face uh, at 90 degrees like mine did there you can force it to do that by just uh, opening the view drop down here and clicking normal to so we're going to get the center rectangle tool that's uh, this icon here if you haven't got that one open you may have the corner rectangle you can access that in the drop down uh, arrow there so center rectangle we're going to lock its center point to the origin there and then we're going to drag it out till it locks itself to the edges of the I-beam so there you go it's locked itself down it's put a relation in there coincident relation so the only other degree of freedom that it has is to do with its uh, height as we're looking at it here you can see I'm dragging that round so we're going to put a uh, smart dimension on that as you can see I was I had that top edge selected so it's it's trying to dimension that edge I'm going to hit escape to cancel that and I'm just going to put a dimension on this vertical so we'll maybe have that as 200 mil so we fully define that sketch so we can exit the sketch now we'll OK OK the sketch and now what we're going to do is we're going to uh, split this top face into the three sections that we need so the way that you do that is in the curves drop down here and it's split line that is the feature that we want to insert uh, you want to select uh, projection as your type of split and then this first box is asking for a sketch so we've made a sketch uh, again I'm going to find the sketch in the feature tree here rather than selecting it over here sketch 2 is the sketch that I want to select it's happy with that it's moved on to the next box and it's asking for faces or faces from the model that you want to use the sketch to split so it's just this top face that we want to split and again I can hit the right mouse button that's what this icon means at the side of my pointer or I could uh, click the tick arrow, uh, tick icon here. So once I've ticked that, if I click away from the sketch, you can see that the sketch is now hidden. It's been absorbed within the split feature there. The sketch is still there, it's just uh, had its state changed to hidden. But uh, what you notice now is if you hover over the top face, you can see uh, just by the preview of which face I'm going to select that it's been split into three sections using the sketch as the boundary of the uh, split so you can see that there so that's uh, that's what we want for our simulation so we're going to do a similar thing to the bottom face here we're going to split this face up into uh, a long center section and then two identical uh, pieces at either end uh, again to simulate uh, maybe columns of bricks or columns of uh, breeze block or concrete block that are supporting this beam at either end. So exactly the same procedure we select the bottom face, we sketch on the bottom face, uh, we're going to use the center rectangle tool again, lock it to the origin, this one's going to be much bigger uh, so we drag it out to somewhere near the end, hit escape to get out of the rectangle tool and then we're going to dimension this relative to the ends of the beam so uh, we'll maybe make this one 200 as well so that's a uh, length at either end of 200 that's been supported and then a length in the center at the top there of 200 that's having the load applied to it so we can OK that sketch because it's fully defined and then same procedure curves drop down menu split line select the sketch that we've just created sketch 3 pick a face that we want to split using that sketch this bottom face I can just right click to OK and again you can see just by clicking on the bottom face now it's been split into uh, three pieces so the next portion of this tutorial uh, we're going to move across into the simulation side uh, of SolidWorks uh, if you don't have the simulations tab visible at the top here there's a few reasons why that might be the case 
Uh, one thing to check first is to uh, check that you have the add-in active uh, because it can be deactivated just to save on loading time for SOLIDWORKS when you boot SOLIDWORKS up. So if you go in the tools menu and then go down to add-ins and then find the add-in here that says SOLIDWORKS simulation and then just tick this tick box at the left which indicates that it's active. So I have mine already ticked. And when you do that the uh, simulation tab should appear on the uh, tabs for the ribbons at the top here and again if it hasn't appeared which it should do you can right click on any of the tabs up here and you can see which tabs are active and uh, it sh if it's not uh, instantly visible up there it should be listed in here and you should be able to uh, tick it and make it active so that's how to get the tab visible we're going to click on the tab now uh, and the only option that we have really that's visible here initially is new study uh, that's what we want to click new study we're going to create just a static study so the forces that we're going to apply to this beam we're going to assume that they haven't been applied in a, a quick fashion so it's not going to induce any uh, vibration in the beam they've been applied slowly and they're not going to vary with time so it's a steady simulation uh, a static simulation so uh, you can name your simulation uh, if you want to you can add a descriptive name there we're just going to stick with the default on this one and then we're going to click on OK and now we're in the simulation uh, uh, tree here so you can see that the feature tree is still there it's just been partially hidden uh, and we've been given this uh, this new interface so we're going to run through the basic steps in order to set up your, your static simulation and one of the first steps that we need to uh, complete is we need to assign a material to this uh, solid part that we've modeled so in this case we'll be simulating some form of steel uh, so we have a library of materials inside of SOLIDWORKS so we're just going to browse the library and pick a, a rough approximation uh, of a steel that would be used for this I-beam so the way that we do that uh, is you see our part uh, is listed at the top of this uh, this uh, new tree, the simulation tree that we've been given here and if we right click on our part you can see it highlights the part and then we want to apply or edit a material so this brings up the uh, library of materials that are inside SOLIDWORKS and as you can see they're arranged into folders and subfolders uh, there's a folder for steels uh, and I think we will just pick an arbitrary steel from here we'll just pick the uh, ANSI or AISI 1020. So you can see that once I pick a material here, uh, properties of the material are populated down in this table down here. So we have the elastic mod modulus, we have the density of the material if we wanted to figure out the mass of this beam, we have the yield strength. So we basically have everything that we need in there in order to run. Uh, an analysis to calculate the stresses and the deformations uh, and show how close we are to the yield point of the material or whether we've gone beyond it so we're going to apply that material to our part uh, you can see that one of the uh, side effects of uh, or one of the side benefits of applying a material in SOLIDWORKS is the appearance of the uh, part changed so it's trying to give a rough approximation of uh, what that steel uh, material would look like uh, so sometimes you want it you want to allow it to do that other times you can uh, turn that feature off uh, you may want to color your parts using uh, false color just so that they're more visible within uh, an assembly so we've applied the material so we've given the uh, we've given the solid uh, model some properties that it's going to need uh, to run the simulation the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to uh, detail how the model, how the uh, part here is fixed in space. So essentially, we're going to fix the ends that we uh, were talking about earlier. And the way that we're going to do that is we're just going to move down to this option here, fixtures. We're going to right-click on there, and I think in this case uh, we're going to make uh, these two pads at either end of this beam entirely fixed. 
So if you want to imagine that in a real world situation, these have essentially been bonded to uh, whatever support uh, is underneath them. So we're assuming that the support that is underneath them is immovable, is entirely immovable, and more than that, this beam simply isn't sat on the top of these columns, it's actually been stuck to the top of the columns uh, using an ideal adhesive. So these pads at the end cannot move in any direction. And that's essentially what our little preview is showing here. So it's showing in the upwards direction, in as we're looking at it, the left direction, uh, and then uh, front to back as well. So those three directions correspond to our little uh, triad preview here. So we've got a Y, an X, and a Z. And it's essentially telling us that it's fixed in all those directions. It can't move. And more than that, it can't actually rotate around any one of these uh, legs of this triad. So uh, it, the two ends are entirely fixed in space. Which, uh, when we get onto more complicated uh, simulations, that's not a, uh, a true representation of, of what would occur uh, in the real situation. But in this case, it's uh, it's a reasonable idealization of the real situation. So it will give us some info, but we have to be careful uh, not to treat these results uh, as a perfect representation of the real uh, uh, stresses and strains that this beam's seeing. So we're going to OK that for the time being. Then we're going to add a load. So as we said, we're going to load up this uh, center section with a force. So you move down to the external loads option, right click on there. Uh, we're going to add a force uh, acting in a downwards direction on that center pad. So you can see as I select the center pad there, uh, the arrows are giving me a preview of the direction of the force that it's uh, trying to uh, apply there. In this particular case, that's fine. Uh, and what it's done is it, it's picked that top surface that center surface and it's applied by default it applies a load that is normal to that surface so when I say normal to I mean at 90 degrees uh, if that wasn't what we wanted uh, we can actually uh, select this next little button down and what that's asking for now is some sort of uh, directional reference so we could use the base planes uh, we could, if we wanted to load this uh, in a front to back direction let's say uh, let's say there's some wind shear or something or something resting on it from uh, from the back of the beam then we could pick this plane which is normal to that direction select this option which is normal to plane and you can see that the arrows have changed to be normal to that plane now so we can uh, we can specify any direction as long as we have a directional reference but in this particular instance normal to is fine for our purposes so we're just going to tap some arbitrary numbers in here uh, let's load this up with 10,000 newtons in the uh, center section so I've just entered that into the entry box let's press enter we can click on OK there so essentially we've done all the uh, preparation work uh, that you need to do before we can run our static simulation. We've applied a material, uh, we've put some fixtures in there that are fixing the thing in position and we've uh, added a force to uh, load the thing up. So the only next step now is we need to uh, change this uh, continuous solid uh, block that we've created, this continuous solid I-beam, into uh, multiple small uh, elements that the system can then uh, create an approximation of the I-beam and then do its calculations uh, to calculate stress and displacement and such like uh, at each point within that mesh. So we're just going to, uh, just for illustrative purposes, we're going to just click on the create mesh uh, option here. So I'm right clicking on this uh, mesh icon and I'm clicking create mesh and then I get this dialog up. I'm not going to touch anything there for the time being. I'm just going to click on OK. Uh, you watch it mesh and this is a preview now of what it's done to my I-beam. So you can see that it's broken it down into these individual little uh, elements that have triangular faces. These are, this is a tetrahedral mess, mesh 
which basically means that these little 3D elements have triangular faces and what it's done is it's gone through the entire solid and it's broken it down into this, these little tetrahedral elements uh, and the name finite element analysis refers to the fact that uh, within any given uh, model there's a finite number of these elements and what it's going to do now is at every node point so where these uh, where these elements meet each other at a single point it can run its stress and displacement calculations at each point and then what it does is depending on how fine the mesh is uh, the readout that you're going to get showing the stresses is going to be uh, lower or higher resolution uh, but it can't calculate this part as a one continuous uh, solid piece of solid material it must split it down into these finite elements in order to run the calculations to calculate the stresses and the displacements so yeah that's just so that we are aware of what it's doing if uh, we didn't want to view the mesh if we were happy with all the default settings what we could have done there was right click here and just go mesh and run and what that's going to do is it will recreate this mesh but it will also run the simulation for us so normally if you don't want to uh, edit any of the mesh settings, how fine the mesh is, how the mesh is distributed throughout the part uh, you can just click on mesh and run so we'll do that now mesh and run you can see it's recreating the mesh again and now it's running the study and because this is quite a simple study the shapes that we're using are quite simple uh, the loading situation is quite simple it's quite quick to run that simulation so you can see that uh, this is quite a worrying uh, looking uh, readout that we've got uh, it looks like for the load that we've applied uh, we've got a massive deformation in the middle of the part but what it's done there is it's, uh, it's exaggerating the displacement of the part so this this sagged portion in the middle uh, 9 times out of 10 will not have moved that far uh, and if you want to see how much that's been exaggerated you can uh, right click on the uh, stress plot over here this is what we're viewing we're viewing the stresses in the part uh, which have been color coded and here's the scale for them at the side here so these uh, uh, newtons uh, per millimeter squared uh, and we can view them you can see that there's some high stress areas that are colored in red there's some lower stress areas down the bottom of the scale in blue but it's also uh, as well as showing us the stresses, it's telling us something about how the part will uh, move when this load is applied. But as I say, it's exaggerated how far it's moved, just to uh, be more illustrative to us. Uh, and the way that you see how much it's exaggerated that is you right click on the plot that you're looking at, you go into edit definition, and you can see there that deformed shape has been ticked if I was to untick that and click on OK you can see it takes it back to an undeformed shape but if I go back in reinstate it uh, and then you can see this automatic option is what uh, gets selected by default and you can see that it's exaggerating that by uh, 869 times so that deformation was 800 it was shown as 869 times greater than it actually is so if you want the true scale you can just click on this option here or you can enter your own scale you can have it ten times exaggerated or whatever number you need so as you can see the true scale you can barely detect any deformation at all so that tends to be why by default it will exaggerate the deformation just to illustrate to you uh, the portions of the model are moving the most so we'll look at some of these plots now uh, where it, by default it selects the stress plot as the first plot uh, and some of the interesting things about this uh, as w we would expect uh, the bits uh, the portions of the part that we fully fixed in position those surfaces are barely seeing any stresses at all and that's because they're fully supported on their underside uh, they're not allowed to move in any direction so that's a perfect support but as you get further away from that surface so you can see as soon as we leave that surface there's the surface just highlighting there that's fully supported the portion of the part uh, that is then unsupported which is this red portion here sees very high stresses and 
that's because uh, wherever you put a perfect support or any form of support uh, immediately adjacent to that uh, the part can then deform and move so what's happening is as we load the center section here this bit's experiencing probably compressive forces uh, and maybe depending on how far this this center section moves uh, it might be experiencing some uh, tension uh, as well so uh, that portion there's uh, quite high stress we, you would ex also expect the portion towards the center where we've done the loading to experience some uh, increased stresses which it has here you can see that it's transitioned through from the blue to the green to the yellow uh, there's a slight hint of moving into the orange portion of the uh, stress plot there as well and obviously everything that we're seeing at this side uh, will be repeated on the symmetrical spot over here but another thing to note from this plot uh, is this little arrow at the bottom which relates to the listed yield strength of our material so the material that we chose the steel material has a yield strength uh, which uh, is uh, using scientific notion is uh, notation sorry is up in the times 10 to the plus 8 so you can see that that's an order of magnitude higher than the highest stress in our stress plot we have a, a, a figure times 10 to the 7 so the yield point is uh, somewhere up uh, around 10 times higher than the stresses that we're seeing in this part so in terms of reaching the yield point uh, we have nothing to worry about with this part we haven't reached the yield point we're significantly lower than the yield point what we might be asking ourselves from this now is uh, do we need such a uh, such a strong I-beam could we change the material to a lighter weight material uh, or maybe size the I-beam down slightly and one of the uh, factors that uh, may affect that is uh, whilst we haven't reached the yield point we're, we're a long way away from it what is the factor of safety how many times under the yield point are we uh, and as I say we're hovering around uh, 10 times depending on what industry you're working in uh, I would say the building industry uh, may have factors of safety maybe of 8 uh, maybe 10 something uh, where high performance and lightweight is more critical like the aerospace industry or high performance motorsport factors of safety as low as 1.5 may be common uh, so now that we're talking about factors of safety uh, we can actually view a plot that specifically uh, uh, shows us information to do with factors of safety so it's representing this stress plot but in a different way and it's relating it more to uh, how many factors of safety our part has so if you want to insert a new plot you uh, right click on results here and you can see the plot types that are available to us we want to define a new factor of safety plot uh, we want to apply it to all bodies in this case we only have one body uh, in this uh, simulation we're going to click the next arrow multiplication factor we're going to leave as one uh, and I think uh, we'll just leave the factor of safety distribution as one as well so basically what we're looking at here is we're looking at the part uh, in terms of uh, the stress plot but we're uh, colouring it relative to how many times uh, the part exceeds the uh, factor of safety of 1 so a factor of safety of 1 would mean uh, the part exactly hits the yield point it neither goes over the yield point nor is it under it's exactly on the yield point of the material so that in most cases would be a bad thing so as the factor of safety increases a factor of safety of 2 would be half uh, way to the yield point of the material so if the yield point if the yield point was 100 then the high stress in the part would be 50 and that's a factor of safety of 2 uh, likewise 4 would be uh, the highest yield point in, in the part uh, the highest stress in the part would be 25 uh, but the yield point for the material is 100 so we can uh, view a factor of safety plot here and you can see that uh, large portions of the part are in red uh, and what we can take from that is that uh, those portions of the part are 1.34 times uh, 10 to the 1 
so they're approximately uh, 13 times factor of safety is what they have and then there are other smaller parts here so these greener areas uh, you can see that these are uh, times 10 to the 4 uh, so you can see how the factor of safety is displayed throughout the part so a few other of the plots that you get by default you get a displacement plot as well which is basically showing us that exaggerated uh, displaced uh, shape of the part but what this also so shows is a scale for these displacements so you can see that it's highlighting the center as the portion of the part that uh, moves the most when you load the center which is what you'd expect uh, the edges here that is fully supported aren't moving at all and the scale tells us uh, the maximum deformation in the part in the red area uh, so again it's a very small deformation in reality uh, it's 2.87 times 10 to the minus 1 so it's 0 0.287 millimeters towards the center but that puts uh, puts a figure on the deformation rather than just showing it in a graphical form uh, we can see the strains in the part we can select the strain plot there uh, and we can see how the strains are just distributed as well uh, and there's many other options in there there's lots of different uh, plots that we can call up there uh, but I think for the basic uh, static simulation uh, that's enough uh, information on how to set them up uh, in order to get you to this point